Good morning. <laughs> Happy New Year. Hey, I want to show you what I got for Christmas. I got this nifty thing right here. It's uh, sky blue. There's not too many of them around. And uh, super happy to wear it. Because the other one, after nine months, it's kind of worn out. So I need it. Crazy year, huh? Well, I want you to know that, you know, for a whole year, they've been speaking death over us. You know, this whole fear thing. I don't care. Politically, I don't care where you're at, which side. It, they all speak death over us. And, uh, you know, and for some of us, that's been part of our journey in life is voices of death. And I want you to know that God has called us not to live under that, you know. And this is the truth. We're all going to die, but it's really how we live that matters. And so we are to live as light, as Chris said, and I want to be sharing a little bit of that with you today as we enter into the new year because I'm not going to preach a message of let's move forward, let's go get them, let's, you know. And oftentimes in life I, during the years of ministry, God has given me kind of a theme for a year, like what, what does he want to do? And uh, the only thing I really received from the Lord this year is that be who you are, your light. Be who you are. And so it's an important thing because why we're a light shining in darkness. Um, earlier in the week, I was just, I was praying and, you know, sometimes I wake up, you know, two, three in the morning and I just start praying and I just can't sleep and, um, and I'm asking God, why is there so much injustice? Why is, why does it seem like evil continues to prosper? Why does it seem like people that do wrong, if you get a parking ticket, you're held to the mat if you do big crimes in government, everybody, it's not an issue. No one ever seems to be held accountable. And uh, what, what is going on, Lord? How, have you ever said this? How long, Lord? Why are you allowing this to happen, Lord? What is the deal, Lord? And it's almost like, you know, this generation is like, what are we doing? And then the Lord started to speak to me. Because sometimes I think God, you know, have you ever thought God's on the throne and in charge and then thought, you are, right? Have anybody ever thought that or is it just the pastor? <laughs> That's scary, huh? And he's in the leader. Well, this is what the Lord spoke to me. He said, I know what injustice is. I know what corruption is, not because I was distant and far from it, because I lived it myself. I get absolute religious corruption. I get absolute government corruption. You know the story of my life. And so that started me to read a little bit again uh, of, of Jesus' last hours on earth. And it was like absolutely corrupt. Absolutely corrupt, yet he allowed it to take place. And so... I want to share a little bit about that with you because it helps us to understand and it sets the stage for us to live in a way that we become light in the darkness because that's the only hope we have. If you don't have God, everything you look at is in the natural. And so your idea of how we fix the natural is by natural means. Well, if I get enough money, if we get the right governor in, the, right, the wrong governor out, the right person here, the wrong person there, if we move this around, if we have all these things, if I get Mr. Right, Mrs. Right, we'll be okay. If we get, you know, all the stuff is in the natural. And the problem is with operating in the natural is the human heart is corrupted. And the saying is true. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. We, and even our best intentions, fall way short. And we have God. What about the people that don't? They operate in what God would call darkness. And they operate with their own mentality. And their greatest hope is that man fixes man. 
and it's never been able to happen in all history. And there's also a spiritual force behind that, which we'll talk about too. But there is a darkness that every generation lives under until the time Jesus comes back and starts to bring judgment and starts to re, you know, finish the work he started so that one day we will live in an earth and on an earth that is functioning with justice and morals and righteousness where we treat each other the way we ought to, where we are treated the way we ought to be treated, and God runs it all. But until that kingdom is fully established, we're going to live under this corruption. The reason, and, and then the question becomes, why? Why is God delaying? And it's this reason, because there are more people to be brought in. It's not over yet. It's not done. See, I've been saved for 35, almost 36 years. I've been saved for 36 years. What if Jesus would have come back 37 years ago? I'd be in a world of hurt. But now that I'm saved and I got this, I want him to start laying the law down, brother. Come on, Jesus, go get them. You know, well, you know what? He's, he saves them one life at a time. And so we're going to look at that. But let's just take a, a, a quick look at Jesus' last night on earth because sometimes we think Jesus hasn't lived like us. He doesn't understand the injustice. Well, after they arrested him in the middle of the night, that, first of all, is illegal. He's faced with religious corruption. And so after they arrested Jesus and all his homeboys fled, and left him. So everybody that said, I'm in like Flint, left like, you know, fast. And so he's brought to the high priest house. This guy's living large, big yard. And in those days, homes had the big yard in front because that's where everybody would gather. So this place is massive. The high priest has got it going on. It says, inside, so we pick up the story in Mark 14, 55, where they have brought Jesus, handcuffed him, brought him in to the high priest so that he could be taken to court, religious court. And it says, inside, the leading priests in the entire high council were trying to find evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death, but they couldn't find any. Didn't stop, should have stopped right there. Kept going. Many false witnesses spoke against him, but they contradicted each other. Finally, some men stood up and gave this false testimony. He, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another made without human hands. Jesus, when he spoke this, was speaking of the temple of his body. What they were most likely was pointing to the temple in Jerusalem, saying that building he's going to destroy. He's, the place where we worship is going to be destroyed by this guy. And so, and they also, you know, he, Jesus also claimed he was God. So they wanted to get him for that. So they make this testimony. But even then, it tells us in verse 59, they didn't get their story straight. Then the high priest stood up before the others and he asked Jesus. So he says, stop, 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 stop. This is crazy. I can't get anything here. We're not accomplishing anything. Well, aren't you going to answer these charges, Jesus? What do you have to say for yourself? But Jesus was silent and made no reply. Then the high priest asked, how many of us are silent when we've been spoken to and lied about and been, you know, people have, have treated us deceitfully. That's an amazing statement. Why? Because he's, there's nothing he can say to change their minds. That right there might help you on your Facebook and Instagram and chat stuff. <laughs> don't talk, don't try to argue with an audience that is not willing to listen. What's the point? The point, because if you keep doing it, what do you want to do? You want to hurt somebody. You want to hurt them preferably, but the next fool that makes you mad is really in trouble because he'll get what they, he got coming and he'll get what you had all stored up. Because here's the deal. When we store up stuff, it's going to come out. How many know that? And it usually comes out destructively. So Jesus 
was quiet. It says, then the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Are you the one? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. For 2,000 years, we've been waiting for that to happen. And we're still waiting for his power to come, his justice to come, all that stuff. So what's the high priest do? Then the high priest tore his clothing to show his horror and said, why do we need any other witnesses? You have all heard this blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty, they all cried. He deserves to die. Then some of them began to spit on him and they blindfolded him and beat him with their fists. These are, these are, high, these are priests. These are ministry people representing God. Prophesy to us, they jeered, and the guards slapped him as they took him away. So we have absolute corruption in the religious hierarchy. Jesus understands corruption. But not only that, then they take him to the government, which was the Roman government, which oversaw everybody. And it says this. After they bring him, it says, Pilate called together the leading priests and other religious leaders along with the people. He says, come in here, what's going on? And he announced his verdict. He says, you brought to me this man to me, accusing him of leading a revolt. I have examined him thoroughly on this point in your presence, and I find him innocent. He should have been let go right then. That would have been justice. Herod came to the same conclusion and sent him back to us. So this is the second time Pilate has seen him. They first bring him to Pilate, and he understands that Jesus is from Galilee. He's, his home kind of base is up there. Herod is in charge there. Go see Herod. And Herod was in Jerusalem at the time, so he goes to see Herod. And Herod just wanted to see him dance across his swimming pool. He just wanted to see a dog and pony show and wanted to see the miracles. And when Jesus wouldn't do them, he goes, I'll get, you know, take him and go back to Pilate. So Pilate takes him back, and he says, the guy's innocent, and Herod thinks he's innocent. So let's just end it right here. Nothing, Herod came to the same conclusion and sent him back to us. Nothing this man has done calls for the death penalty. So I will have him flogged, and then I will release him. I will have him flogged because he's innocent. I will beat the daylights out of him. That makes you happy. And then I'll let him go. So we pick up the injustice. Talk about political injustice, absolute political injustice. Nothing is done. They had the power and the, the, the right to free him. They said he's innocent, but they wouldn't free him. He understands. This kind of corruption has been going on forever. Some of your eyes might have been open this year to corruption in our own country in a way we haven't seen before, at least openly, and, and are blown away. Corruption in the natural realm is the method of the day, and it has been for generations after generations. Whether it's socialism, republics, Marxism, kingships, uh, monarchies, all that, it doesn't matter. They are all doomed to fail because they are all based on man fixing man. I can't even fix me. So, we pick up the story again. In John chapter 19, verse 1, then it says, Then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a leaded, tipped weight. So they beat him, beat him bad. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put a purple robe on him. That's police brutality right there. Hail, king of the Jews, they mocked as they slapped him across the face. Pilate went outside again and said to the people, I'm going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly that I find him not guilty. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said, look, here is the man. That word, look, here is the man, if you were to take it in its context, means he was beat so bad that he was unrecognizable. They, 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 they bloodied his face. I mean, he was a mess. So he's telling them, this is the guy that we just saw a while ago that wasn't like this. And so he's wearing this robe, he's wearing these crowns that are, the thorns are a couple inches long, beat into his head, because they beat him on the head too, and they flogged him, 
which is a, a, a massive whipping, front and back body. The, they, they beat both sides. So, you know, and this is the innocent guy. And so, when they saw him, it tells us in verse 6, when the, the religious leader saw him, the leading priests and the temple guards began shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Take him, and that, so what's Pilate do? Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find him not guilty. So they kill him, and Pilate gives the approval when he had the moral and the righteous obligation to let him go. So Jesus, in answering my cry to him the other night of why is there so, you allowing so much evil, is to say that evil's been here a long time, Joe. I experience evil myself. I will deal with it, but Joe, there's a lot of lives out there that still need to be saved. They live in darkness. Yet, and there's another thing here, all this absolute corruptness served God's ultimate purpose. Speaking to his disciples before they actually arrested him that night. I've told you what happened. But before they actually arrested him, they went to get him. And Peter jumps in front, hits a guy on the ear with his sword. He's not a good swordsman. And uh, Jesus heals it. And Jesus says to him this. He goes, Pete, don't you realize in Matthew 26, 53... Don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us? And he would send them immediately. But if I did this, how would the scriptures be fulfilled and dis uh, that describe what must happen now? How would I be able to save mankind if I didn't go through to save them? Have you ever thought, and I've asked God, why, why didn't you send angels to save my daughter? Why don't you send some angels? Have you guys ever asked God for angels in particular? Said, why didn't you just heal me? Why, didn't, why, why are you doing this? Part of that reason is because God's got a bigger picture, and that's where we have to exercise our faith. Jesus says in John 12, speaking to his disciples, he says this, the time for judging this world has come. I am going to judge the corruption. I'm not gonna give the pronouncement of punishment yet. I'm gonna judge wrong as wrong. And when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out, he goes, now there's something behind the scene of all the corruption in the world. There is a spiritual force that is absolutely corrupt. And of course, Jesus said his intent is to kill, steal, and destroy. So kill, killing, stealing from others, greed, and all that kind of stuff is what he is all about. Trying to get the Lord's power, trying to get God's power. So for people to be power hungry, they're just operating in the methodology of the enemy. Greed and all the other stuff is designed to destroy. Any which way he could destroy us, he will. There's a power behind all the other corruption. And he says, it will be, this one will be cast out. When? And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. Corruption must continue. The enemy will be cast out. So how do you cast out the enemy? one person at a time, one life at a time. He doesn't do it with establishing some government on this earth and that government is going to operate with, no, outside of the kingdom of God and Jesus being king, all other governments are doomed to fail. All other stuff is going to fall, it's all sand. So he says, listen, when I am lifted up, when my death takes place, I will draw people one person at a time. That's how lives are changed. That's why it goes from generation to generation to generation, every generation, until the time the Lord comes back. And then even after that, there'll be people coming into the kingdom. But this is what he says, in, this is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. 
He says, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. Have you ever been around a blind person? No matter what you do, they can't see. They are in what we would call darkness. So he says, Satan's dealing with people is to keep them in darkness. So in that darkness, if this room was absolutely dark and everybody in here was operating in this, we'd be running around, we'd all be trying, we'd, we'd be chaotic. We couldn't help ourselves, because why? We can't see. He has blinded their ability to see beyond the natural. That's why some of us have said at times in our lives, if there really was a God, why would he allow evil? And that's the reason we say that is we're looking at the natural and thinking that if there is a God, the only way he operates is in the natural that I see. And therefore, the way I see it is the way he ought to see it. And we are locked into that because we have been blinded. I was blinded for a little less than half my life. I looked at when I, when I got over 30 years in Jesus, I said, wow, I've lived longer now in Jesus than I lived without him. And that was, to me, that was kind of an accomplishment. And it was like, wow, but for 30 years, I, I lived in darkness. I thought the things I'd, I called evil good and good evil. I thought everyone's bad, so I could, you know, I could steal. I was done wrong by people, so I get to do wrong. And I had all these belief systems, which everybody in darkness has to some degree or another. Now, you may be thinking, this is the crazy part, because if you're a believer in Jesus, you still got darkness in you in places. How many know what I'm talking about? If we were to take your thoughts and put, you know, flash them up there, you'd be embarrassed. I would be. And I love Jesus. And some of my thoughts aren't good. So we who have been eye-opened still struggle. How about those people that haven't? They operate the way they operate because that's the way you operate in darkness. He says, they've been, they are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand. In fact, they think good news is bad news. Heck, and even in our country now, our Congress says you can't even call men men and women women. Because somehow that's weird. It's like, are you kidding me? How, or mother or fathers, grandpa, you know, those we don't use those terms. You can't smoke a cigarette till you're 18 legally. But at five year old, you can determine your gender. And in some way, that makes sense to them. But see, when you get a little light, you begin to look at things and go, what? Then we're amazed that people don't see that. And all kinds of other stuff is going on. So we're living in crazy times, but this is the way it is because when people are in darkness enough, Something happens when a light shows up. So he says they don't understand the message of the glory of Christ because they don't think there's any glory in that. There's nothing good about it. How many in here thought Jesus was a joke at one point in your lives? Yeah. What did the rest of you think? <laughs> Didn't think about him. <laughs> nice guy. <laughs> We all had thoughts, or we didn't. You know, it's just, it, he wasn't a factor. So, God in his graciousness doesn't leave us in this condition. He brings light to the world. In fact, that's one of the aspects, the beautiful aspects of Christmas. In Isaiah 9, when the, uh, the prophet sees the birth of the Messiah come, and he says this, the people who walk in darkness, that's everybody in the world, 
will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. And when you see this light, see, it's not about you. This is the thing. We don't save ourselves. It's not about me all of a sudden coming to the light. I understand the light. It's God does something to touch us, to draw us. And usually it's in times of trouble, times of frustration, times of I don't understand what's going on. And he uses that great pain, great loss, uh, uh, something that shatters the way we do life normally creates oftentimes that opening to where God's light penetrates. So all that is orchestrated or at least allowed by God to cause us to see something. And then when that happens, the most amazing thing happens. It says in John 1, 12, all who believed him and accepted him, all who see the light receive that light, he gave the right to become children of God. You now belong to God. And just like in the natural, you are a babe in the Lord. When God designed, and I've shared it with you guys many times, when God designed the supernatural and the natural, they parallel each other. He didn't make them so that neither one could ever understand the other. He designed it so that it all connects. He's a God of order. He gave us part of the physical to show us how the, soup, how the, the spiritual grows. You come in as a baby, then you have to grow. No, there's no human being that is born, comes out of the womb, whoa, I'm ready to go now. We're moving and heading. That was a tough tunnel, but I made it. <laughs> and we're good to go. Now, where's my car? I got things to do. I got people to see. They're, what? They have to grow and mature. It's the same thing in our Christian walk. I thought when I became a Christian, all of a sudden, everything changed in my life. And I wouldn't have anger. I wouldn't want to steal and, and all this other stuff. And that took time in my life to grow, and I see things much different 34 years, 35 years, whatever, in the Lord than I did it five years in the Lord. I, I see, I understand more. I understand that sometimes God will allow us to go through the most horrible things that we would consider to be horrible because he wants to reach people in darkness that go through the same things, but they have no light. And so he allows us to go through it so that we may enter into their world and bring light because we have commonality in the darkness. And that's a door opener to them. Light is a big deal to God. From his perspective, the whole world suffers in darkness. And he wants to reach people in that darkness. For he tells us in Timothy, Timothy that God desires no person to be lost. So in John 1, 5, we're told this. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. So the enemy is always trying to extinguish it, but he can't. Listen, Jesus said this about himself, and then listen to what he says about us. In John 8, 12, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness. You'll live in a dark world, but you yourself won't have to walk like they do in darkness. You will see, and that progressive scene increases. He says, if you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. And you know what one of the things that life, this light does? It gives you a passion for life. You begin to, how many of us in here struggled with, why am I here? What's this all about anyway? What, what do I, I work? One of the biggest eye openings in my life was watching my dad work six and a half days a week and then die of cancer when I was 17 years old. It was like, that's what life is? You work till you die? Where's that cocaine? 
well, is this, the, is this the point of it? What is this all about anyway? What's going on? And being molested by a priest, I saw religious corruption. Then as I got older, I lived through Vietnam and all that stuff and saw political corruption. And it was like, well, what is the purpose of living here? What is this all about? You know what? Live for today. But when you get the light, you, be, you start to look at life differently and we begin to change and life begins, oh, I begin to have a passion to help people, to help those in darkness, whether it's feeding them or whether it's ministering to them or whether it's just loving them, whatever it is. Something starts changing, and the picture in our life starts to change from one of what is, why are we here, what's the purpose, to, oh, there is a purpose. These people hurt, and I'm hurting. And so Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And then he said this about his disciples, you and I. Verse five, 14 of chapter 5 of Matthew, it says, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine. Oh, okay, that's the light. That's what light looks like. It looks like good deeds. Let it shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. They will see where the light comes from. He says, you guys are the light of the world. The difference is, I, Jesus said, am literally the light of the world. You are a lamp that is lit by me, and that light gives light to everyone. It's almost like if this room was completely dark, it doesn't even have to be a bright light. If this room was completely dark and I lit a match up here, everyone in the room could see it. It would give light to everyone. It may be way over there, but it gives light. It doesn't have to be massively bright. And he said, listen, you were designed to be a light in your house and like a light on a hill to your community. That's what begins to change in us. We become a, li a light in our own household. And, and part of light is it's authentic. That doesn't mean it's perfect. One of the aspects of, of, of light is it, it's the real deal. You see with clarity. So what does that mean? That means I don't stand up here and tell you how perfect I am because I'm giving you false light. If you follow Jesus long enough, it'll all go perfect for you. No, that's, that would be false light. That's fake light. That's smoke and mirrors. When you follow Jesus, you're going to sometimes succeed wonderfully, and sometimes you will fail. Sometimes you will go sideways, and sometimes you will stay straight. You will be like people, except you have now some light, and you can see. And he says that needs to be seen, not just your good parts, but your whole part. Nothing is concealed in light. Nothing is concealed. In fact, we're told in another of the Gospels that Jesus said everything that is concealed will be revealed. Why? Because the more it is revealed, the better the light is, the greater it can shine. He says those who allow the light to penetrate their own lives, they become greater in helping, each other, helping others. If you don't, then you lessen, just like different wattages illuminate in greater ways. So he says, listen, this light is meant to be seen. He says, and don't take it and put it under a bushel. What, why, what does that mean? Well, in the Roman household, they didn't have electricity, and much of the world today doesn't have electricity. So what do they do? They keep a lamp lit all the time. During the day, they put it in a safe place in their home, kind of like a, a, a ceramic type of covering, and they put it under there to keep it lit. So that night comes, they can take that and light the other lights. Now, when the oil starts to run low in that lamp, they bring in another lamp, light it, put it there, take out this lamp. 
So every night there's always light. Another aspect of light for us is stay lit. Stay lit. Why? That illuminates life for those in darkness. You're going to suffer the same things that people do in the world that don't have God. But when your light still shines, when you're in trouble, that is, a tri- that is something that draws people to it. How do you handle this? How do you deal with that? What's up with that? How come you're not like everybody else, running crazy? The light has to stay lit. The third thing about a light is it gives direction. So you look at it like a, 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 a matchstick or a candle illuminates. But he says you're also a flashlight. And it doesn't have to be a big powerful. Drive over it with the car flashlights that you see advertised. Take this thing and beat anything with it. It can be a little flash. A flashlight simply gives direction. And for those walking in darkness... You are strategically placed in your home and on the hill of wherever that is in your sphere of influence. You are strategically placed there. If you're, if you're working with a bunch of jerks, just make sure you're not the biggest jerk. Then you're the light in that arena. You're that person. And we give direction because when they're in trouble, I had one of our our deacons um, get a call from somebody that knew him over a decade ago. Hadn't even seen the guy in a decade. But when death hit their home, these were unchurched people. They're, They're living in their world. He remembered this guy. He remembered the light he's shown in their little world and he calls him for help. That's what a light does. It might not, you know, be getting the answers we want immediately, but people remember people that do right in times of wrong. They might not like you saying anything, but you're the one they'll call. When I was driving the beer truck in the last four years of me living there or living in that job, I was walking the walk. And, and people would laugh, and I'd come into the, we had the room where they would lay out the routes and all that stuff, and there's 34 of us in there. And when I came in, they kind of got a hush over that because I was like the, the Jesus guy. Well, the Jesus guy was always doing therapy sessions between two trucks because they would find me, and they'd want to know you know, hey, man, I'm, ha- I'm really struggling in my family. And then they'd look out to make sure no one's looking. Yeah, can you, uh, you know, can, what do I do? And they said, why? Because light that is consistent. See, if, if I'm a light that, you know, I, when, when things are going good, shining bright, leading them all, and things are going bad, and acting crazy as they act, that's, that instability affects our ability. People aren't going to be guided by someone that doesn't know where they're going. How many of us have lived that way? Follow me, I'm lost. There's a change that needs to take place. Stay lit, my friends, in this year. Be who you are. Well, what does that look like? What does staying lit look like? Looks like this, man. Woman. In a world that is always worried, the follower of Jesus should stand out as calm. In a corrupt world, the follower of Jesus lives with integrity. In a fearful world, the follower of Jesus should stand out as courageous. In an unstable world, the follower of Jesus should stand out as a model of stability and steadfastness in the midst of change. We keep on keeping on. Doesn't mean we march valiantly. It means sometimes we walk with the limp. Sometimes we'll be limping the rest of our lives, but we limp well. In a selfish world, the follower of Jesus should stand out as generous. 
in a world filled with pain, the follower of Jesus should stand out for their compassion. In a world filled with confusion, the follower of Jesus should stand out for their faith. In a depressed world, the follower of Jesus should bring hope. In a world filled with hate, we should stand out for our love. Living under the king, according to his government, is our only chance of impacting the world for good that will sustain and change lives. Listen, what Ephesians tells us about us. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ so we can do good things that he planned for us long ago. Your trials, your tribulations, the circumstances you go for are all part of the plan And I've shared it with you guys before, too. If God wants to reach a particular group of people, he has to bring lights into that. And not many of us volunteer for some of the lighting he wants to do. But that will give us commonality. So the fact that Jesus has invited you to be in his family and on his ministry team should do wonders for your self-worth. I always thought I was special. I didn't know I was that special that Jesus would pick me. Jesus picked me and still is faithful to me when I'm running strong or when I'm not running at all. I'm barely moving and even when I'm standing still, he is faithful. He picked you. And so he knows all about me. He knows all about you. And those things of our weakness are part of the light that shines that helps people understand the grace of God. Because if I tell people the only way God loves you is if you walk the perfect walk, then one, I'm a hypocrite, and two, I'm a liar. They need to understand that I fall too and that I have a God that accepts me. That's light to people. That your past doesn't define you. It's just your past. And that God is in the process of using us to deal with the corruption in the world that can never be healed. We can only draw people out of it. Whether we're corrupting ourselves with stuff whether others have corrupt us. Part of our problem right now is all the death, and I shared it in the beginning, all the death spoken over us. Everything's gonna kill us. Be careful, everything's gonna kill you. Everything's gonna kill you. This is gonna just destroy everybody. This is gonna be, and you know what? There's a disease, but there always is. And yeah, I wear my mask, but, you know, I keep on playing, marching. It is important for us to gather together. I believe it in the bottom of my heart. It is important for us to continue our lives as light. You're afraid? I'll go with that. I'll, you know, I'll be all things to all men in the hope of winning a few. I won't, be, I won't sin, but I'll be all, uh, you know, if, you, if you're more comfortable with this, I'll, okay, I'm good with it. I mean, I, I'm in recovery, and if you uh, call, you know, I know I'm a child of God, but if calling me an alcoholic helps you to relate and keeps us in that same game or keeps us, I, I'm good with that. I'm good with that. I don't need to beat you down. If I know more than you know, let me get to your level and help you deal with what you got. Because if I don't, I'm just an arrogant Christian. And all of us know how much we love arrogant people. Listen, thank you, Chris. It's my associate over there. It's part of his job. <laughs> One of his gifts is he's a, he's a, a great encourager. You know. That's so funny, too, because we were talking the other day. This is off this topic, but it's still in the topic. Is that, you know, whatever gift God gives you in the, in the uh, spirit... The opposite is also 
in the flesh. So a great encourager in the flesh, they can be a great discourager. They can, those that can build up well when it, in the spirit, when they operate in their flesh, they can tear you to the quick. How many have ever noticed that? Every gift, kindness, operate in the flesh, we can be cruel. You know, generosity, if we operate in that in the, in the spirit, we're loving, we're generous. In the flesh, we're greedy. That's why many of us, you know, and one of the beautiful things about our church, we have so many people in different kinds of recovery that they know the pain of, of greedy, selfish, hurting, cruel people. And so they can, minister, they can turn that around and be a blessing, and we have great compassion. When you've been wounded deep, you can be very compassionate. You can also, in the flesh, be, wound, be very good at wounding others too. So even though I love the Lord, forgiveness sometimes is difficult. How many know that? I have to forgive the guy that murdered my daughter. I don't know, and I've shared it with you guys before, 10, I don't know, on a good week when I'm really walking with Jesus, like seven times I have to forgive him. On a bad week, a lot more. <laughs> and, I, you know, it, because it, it, that's the way it is in our walk with God is that there isn't, and there isn't too much in our lives that we're trying to overcome that's one and done. Most of it is, is an ongoing struggle in some area or not. You know, of you guys that are married, how many of you know that loving your spouse, sometimes it's easy. Other times, it's really a choice. And so, you need to understand this going into 2021. We are on a mission from God to bring light to the lost. And how does that mission roll out? Around you. It's just simply around you. He says the light stays in the house and is on a hill for the community around it. Be that light. Be who you were designed to be. They need comfort light, then be comfort light. I always tell people, you know what? Be a porch light. Be a welcoming porch light. You know, don't, don't be a laser. People don't really like lasers in their eyes. You know, it's a light, but not that helpful. Be the kind of light that people need to see. Whether it's speaking the truth, be that light. Whether it's comforting the hurting. Whether it's calming the shaky. And then point to Jesus. That's our hope, one person at a time. That's how we cast out the enemy's control over us. Amen? How many do want to do that? All right, why don't we stand up? Let's pray. So you're going to repeat after me. Lord Jesus, keep the fire lit in me. In this world, operating in darkness, make me a light in my sphere of influence. Help me that I may illuminate well that I may not hide behind it. I, I just got something for some of us in somebody in here is uh, they hide their light because they're ashamed. They're ashamed they're not walking up to the level they should be, or they have this idea of what someone who is a light, you know, what, what level of perfection you have to hit. And because they are not at that place, they basically put their light under that little, under that ceramic covering. Oh, it's lit, but it's under there and it's not really shining. You need to kill that right now. You need to repent of that. Because this is the thing. God only uses sinners. Of which you are one. And that ain't never gonna change this side of heaven. I'm saved, I have the light in me, but I also got some dark spots, some blind spots. And yet, the light that I do have, let that shine in the place where it does. Quit judging yourself in that arena. Deal with it, but quit judging yourself about that. If you think you gotta reach some level 
of, of, of holiness before God can use you, that is a lie from the pit of hell. That's darkness. And it's absolutely not true. So I'm just gonna lead you in a repentance prayer. Lord Jesus, I repent from thinking that I have to be at some level of holiness to be valuable, to be used by you. I renounce that and I reject that as a lie from the pit of hell. And I affirm that you have received me, you accept me, and I acknowledge the truth that I fail. But nonetheless, you forgive me and you are in the process of maturing me that I may walk better. But in my walk, I am still light. Use me in this year to bring hope to the hopeless, faith to the faithless, joy to the depressed. Help me, Lord, to light my sphere of influence in a good way. And I thank you for that. Thank you for choosing me to be on your team, to be your child, to be your ambassador in this world. And all God's kids said, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.